In this video, I'm going to illustrate how to use Microsoft Visual Web Developer to create a user interface design. To start off the process, you want to go up to the File drop-down menu and select New Website. In the New Website, underneath of Installed Templates, you could choose Visual Basic or Visual C Sharp. I'm going to suggest that you choose Visual Basic. Then in the center of the new website window, you want to select ASP.NET Empty Website. At the bottom of the new website window, in the web location, I'd like to ask you to type in, as the name of the website, Test Website. And make sure you take note of the location in which the website is going to be saved. After you've done that, you can push on the OK button. In the right-hand side of Microsoft Visual Web Developer, at the top, you should see the Solution Explorer window. And in it, you should see your empty website, test website. What we're going to begin doing is adding files to that website. And the first type of file that we're going to add is a master page. So what you want to do in the Solution Explorer window is select Highlight the Website, do a right click, and then select Add New Item. In the Add New Item window underneath of Installed Templates, again, I'm going to recommend you select Visual Basic. Then in the center of this window, I'd like to ask you to please scroll down until you see Master Page. And I'd like to ask you to select Master Page. And you can leave the name of the file as master page dot master. After you've done that, you can push on the Add button. You should see that the file has been added to your website. You should see it in the Solution Explorer window. It's named master page dot master. And in the code editor, in the center of Microsoft Visual Web Developer, you should see the HTML that's included in that master page file. What I'd like to ask you to do right now is make a few minor updates to this HTML, starting off by removing its div elements. After you've made those updates, after you've removed the div elements, the contents of the master page should look as you see in my code editor right now. As you're making changes to your website, make sure that you're saving those changes. Now what I'd like to ask you to do is go out to Max Design. I provided you the URL to this website so that you could use it to choose a layout for your website. Max Design is a fabulous website that you can use to see what different web layouts look like. For example, you can see what the one column fixed width layout looks like. you can see what the two column fixed width layout looks like. Slightly different. You can see what the three column fixed width layout looks like. It's slightly different too. What you should do using Max Design is decide which layout you like, which layout you would like to use in your test website. Check them all out give them a look and see which one you prefer. Once you've done that, then go into the layout and scroll down. 
because what Max Design provides you for each layout is the HTML markup and the CSS code that together will generate the layout. What we're going to do is we're going to include the CSS code and HTML markup in our master page, starting with the HTML markup. So what I'd like to ask you to do is please select all of the HTML markup, copy it, do a control C, go back into Microsoft Visual Web Developer and right where my cursor is flashing right now I'd like you to place your cursor and then I'd like you to paste the HTML markup that you just copied. So your master page should now look something like mine. We're going to make a few updates to this HTML markup that you just pasted into your master page. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to remove all of the HTML that I have selected right now. So please select this HTML, highlight it, and then remove it. Then what we're going to do is scroll up a bit and where you see the HTML that looks like the HTML that I have highlighted, I'd like you to ask, I'd like to ask you to highlight that. What you're going to do is you're going to remove it from its current location. You're going to do a control X. And then go down below to where my cursor is flashing right now. And I'd like to ask you to paste that HTML using a control V. So now your HTML should look something like what you see in my code editor. I'm going to clean it up a little bit. I'm going to get rid of the extra white space. And this is what your HTML should look like now. And this is the HTML again in your master page. So I'd like to ask you to save your work. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to scroll up a little bit in the master page. Up to this area where it says head and then below that it says title and I'd like to ask you to place your cursor at the end of that line that says title and then hit enter and what we're going to do is we're going to type in a little bit of HTML just a little bit and it should look like this Okay, it should look just like that. Your cursor will probably be flashing right in the middle almost of that line that you just got done typing. It should be flashing right where my cursor is flashing. What I'd like to ask you to do with your cursor flashing in that location is hit the enter key a couple of times so that your HTML now looks like what you see in my code editor and then you can place your cursor right on that empty line and then make sure you're saving your work as you go. Okay. Now what I'd like to ask you to do is go back out to the Max Design website, scroll down to where it says CSS code and copy all of it copy all of that CSS code. Do a control C. Go back into Microsoft Visual Web Developer and where your cursor is flashing, paste it. Do a control V. And then save 
the changes that you've made to the master page. Now, down towards the bottom of the code editor on the left-hand side, you should see various buttons. One says source. That's the active button. That's the button that's active right at the moment. One says split, and one says design. I'd like you to push the design button. Okay. This is what your master page looks like. And I think that you would agree it's exactly what the web page looked like on Mac's design. Okay? So we've generated a master page in Microsoft Visual Web Developer that has the same layout as the layout we saw in Mac's design. Okay? Now, what we're going to do in Microsoft Visual Web Developer is we are going to apply the layout in this master page to all of the pages that we add to our website. And we're going to add four pages to our website. We're going to add a home page. We're going to add an about page. We're going to add a services page. And we're going to add a contact us page. Okay? So let's do that right now. Let's start off by adding a new item to our website for the home page. So in the Solution Explorer window, select the website, do a right click, select Add New Item, and in the Add New Item window, underneath of Installed Templates, select Visual Basic, okay, and in the center of the Add New Item window, at the top, select Web Form. Down at the bottom of the Add New Item window, change the name of the Web Form from Default to Home. And then at the bottom of the window, over in the right-hand corner, select or check, select Master Page. Okay, so in the bottom of the Add New Item window, check, select Master Page, and push the Add button. And in the Select a Master Page window, underneath of Contents of Folder, make sure that your Master Page is selected. And then push on the OK button. In the Solution Explorer window, now you should see your master page and you should see your home page. And in the code editor right now, you see the source code for the home page. We're going to make an update. Okay, this is HTML again. We're going to make an update to the HTML. What we're going to do at the very top, where it says title, Place your cursor in between the double quotes and type in the word home. Okay? And then save that change. Then what we're going to do is we're going to add another page for about. So underneath of the Solution Explorer window, select the website, do a right click, select Add New Item. Underneath of Installed Templates, select Visual Basic. In the center of the window, select Web Form. In the name, change the name from Default to About. Make sure Select Master Page is checked and push Add. In the Select a Master Page window, make sure your Master Page is selected and push on OK. So now you should see a third file in your website for About. And that file, the HTML for it, should be loaded in the Code Editor. And we're going to make a change again. We're going to change the title so that it says About. We're going to do that two more times. 
one for services and one for contact us. Okay, so now we have five files in our website. One is a master page that has the HTML and CSS to generate a page layout like the one that you can see right now in the code editor. And we have four individual web form files, a home web form file, an about web form file, a services web form file, and a contact us web form file. And the layout that we've defined in the master page, we made sure that we applied it to each of the web form files. Okay. Now what we're going to do in the Solution Explorer is we're going to select the home page. We're going to do a right click and then the pop-up that appears, we're going to select start, Set as Start Page. Set as Start Page. And by doing that, what that means then is every time we run our website, the home page is going to be the first page that's loaded in the browser. Okay, So select Set as Start Page. Save your changes. And now what we're going to do is we're going to run our website. At the top of Microsoft Visual Web Developer there's a button that has a green triangle on it. If you place your cursor over it, it should say start debugging. I'd like to ask you to please push that button. Okay, And there'll be a window that pops up that says debugging not enabled. Well, I'd like you to select at the bottom of this window, Run Without Debugging, and then push on OK. And what should happen is your website should load in IE, and the home page should be the page that's loaded. But you should be able to navigate to the other pages well, not yet. I'm sorry about that. We need to make one more change um, to our master page before we do that. I apologize for that. But you should see your website, specifically the home page, loaded in IE. Okay, it should look like that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go back into Microsoft Visual Web Developer. We're going to make some changes to the master page that will allow us to do what I was trying to do just a few moments ago, will allow us to navigate between the pages. Okay, So close IE, go back into Microsoft Visual Web Developer, go into the master page, and you may be in design mode right now. The design button may be the active button, which means you're in design mode. What I'd like to ask you to do is go back into source mode. Push the source button. Okay, And again, this is the mode where we can see the CSS code and we can see the HTML. And what we're going to do is we're going to make some updates to this section of our HTML, the section that I have highlighted. And specifically, what we're going to do is we're going to change the pound characters that you see here. There are four pound characters. We're going to change them. Okay. 
so that instead they say home.aspx about aspx services.aspx and contact.aspx so let's make those changes what you can do to make it a little easier for yourself while the cursor is flashing between the double quotes like you see mine right now you can push the control and the space key on your keyboard and you should see something that looks like this a little pop-up that lists the names of your files and you can double click on home.aspx and it will pre-fill for you in the location where your cursor was so let's do that for each of the pound characters let's remove them and replace them with the appropriate file and again the key combination that you use to bring up that little pop-up that lists your website files is control space So your HTML should now look something like what you see in my code editor. Make sure you save your changes and let's run the website again. Okay, so again we see the home page loaded in IE. We can tell it's the home page because in the tab at the top of IE it says home but now what we can do is we can click on these hyperlinks for about and it changes the page that's loaded in the browser you can see that in the tab at the top it says about and you can also see that in the location box the URL it's referring to your about.aspx file so we can navigate to services and we can also navigate to contact us and then if we want we can go back to the home page okay so now I'd like to ask you to close IE go back into your master page push the design button to take you into design mode and maybe you may want to make changes to the layout maybe you don't like the color the gray and the black or maybe you don't like the font that you see okay well you can make changes to that okay for example maybe you don't like the gray color of the header okay well what you can do okay select where it says site name place your cursor up there somewhere in the master page where it says site name and then down at the bottom of the code editor you should see these buttons for HTML body form div container okay what I'd like to ask you to do is push that button that says div container okay and you can see in the code editor okay that your entire layout has been selected now what I'd like to ask you to do is push the button beside that that says div header and you can see in the code editor that the header section of your page has been highlighted well we want to change the color of that let's say we want to change the color of the header from gray okay maybe to yellow or some other color so we can do that okay on the right hand side of visual web developer below the solution explorer there's a window that says properties okay and in that window there is a row that says style I'd like to ask you to place your cursor okay in the second column of that row right beside where it says style you can see my cursor is flashing there right now you should see a button 
that has three dots. Okay, just like that. You place your cursor in the column right beside the column that says style. You should see three buttons. I'd like you to push or a button that has three dots. I'd like you to push that button. It's going to bring up a window that looks like this. It says modify style at the top. On the left hand side of this window I'd like you to select background. Then in the center of this window I'd like you to select the drop down for background color. You should see something that looks like this. But then I'd like to ask you to select more colors. And here we have a palette of colors that we can choose from, a color that will be applied to our header. Okay, So I'm going to choose this pale yellow color. And I'm going to push on OK. And then I'm going to push on OK again. And now the color of our header has changed from gray to yellow. So we're going to save that. Well, let's make the footer the same color as the header. So what I'd like to ask you to do is place your cursor down here in your layout, your web page layout, down here where it says copyright site name. Place your cursor there. And at the bottom of the code editor you should see a button that says div footer. Make sure that button is selected. Make sure it's pushed. And then do the same thing. Go over into the Properties window, place your cursor beside where you see Style, push the button that has three dots in the Modify Style window, select Background, then select Background Color, More Colors, and then select Yellow. Okay, So now the footer is yellow too. Make sure you're saving as you go. Okay. Well, maybe you don't like the font. Maybe you're not pleased with the overall font and you'd like to change it. Everywhere you can do that. Okay. Down at the bottom, place your cursor. I'd recommend you place your cursor somewhere in your layout. Maybe right where I have mine where it says site name. And then down at the bottom of the code editor to ask you to push the button that says div container. Push that. Again, you can see that your entire layout is selected. Again, on, in the Properties window, beside Style, place your cursor. Push the button that has three dots. In the Modify Style window, underneath of Category, let Font Selected. Leave Font Selected. Then, in the Font Family, select the drop-down and you can pick any font you wish. Okay, I'm going to scroll down. Oops. Okay, and I'm going to use this font. Select that. I'm going to push OK. And now you can see that the font has changed. Okay, and the interesting thing is you've made these changes only in the master page but because you have applied the layout in the master page to all of your other web pages, when you run them, you're going to see the changes reflected in each of them. So let's do that. Let's run our website again. Okay, now you can see the home page is loaded in IE and all of the changes that we made, the changes to the color of the header and the color of the footer, the changes in font have been applied to all of the pages. Okay, And we can navigate to the pages. Okay, well, Let's close IE. Now what we want to do is we want to go into these individual pages and we want to add some content to them because right now they're empty. Right now they're totally empty. So what we're going to do first of all is we're going to go into the contact us page. Okay? And we're going to add a form to this page. 
we're going to add some labels, some fields um, to the page. Okay, so go into the Contact Us page and then go into Design Mode. Push the Design button. Okay, and you should see your Contact Us page in design mode. Now you can make changes to it here when it's in design mode and that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to make changes to it. But to make the changes you have to make sure that your cursor is flashing in the area that says content placeholder 1. Okay, there's an area sort of in the in the center of the layout that says content placeholder 1. You want to make sure your cursor is flashing there. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to insert a table in that content placeholder. So go up to the top of Visual Web Developer and select Table and then Insert Table. And it's going to bring up a window that looks like this where we can specify certain characteristics of the table including the number of rows that it has and the number of columns. And we're going to leave the number of columns at 2 but we're going to change the number of rows to 7. So we're going to insert a table that has 7 rows and 2 columns. After you make those changes in the insert table window you can push on OK and now what you should see in that content placeholder is a table okay, with 7 rows and 2 columns. Now what we're going to do is we're going to begin adding labels and buttons and list boxes and text fields into this table. Okay. But in order to do so, the first thing you have to do in the left hand side of Microsoft Visual Web Developer, in the toolbox window, you want to open up what's called the standard toolbox. It might be closed. You might not be able to see what's included in it. To open it, you push the arrow or the triangle beside it. And it should open and you should see something that looks like this. Okay? You see something that says pointer, bulleted list, button, checkbox, drop down list, hyperlink, image, list box, panel, text box. Okay? These are all things that can be added to a web page. And that's what we're going to begin doing right now. We're going to add things like labels and buttons to this web page. We're going to start off by adding labels. Okay. So what you're going to do is select underneath of the standard toolbox label, highlight it so that it looks like what you see. And do a left click and then drag it over into the first row, the first column of our table and then let go of the left mouse button. Okay, we're going to do that again. Okay, so if that didn't work for you correctly, don't worry, we're going to do that again. Okay, but right now the label says label. Okay, and we don't want it to say label, we want to change that so that it says something else. So we're going to go over into the properties window. Okay? And in the properties window, one attribute that we can see of a label is its text. Right now it says label. And we're going to change that to contact reason. Just type in contact reason where it previously said label. Type in contact reason and then hit enter and you should see that the actual label in your web page changed from label to contact reason. Okay, we're going to make a few more changes to the properties of this label. Okay, scroll down, go into the properties window and scroll down. To the very bottom where it says ID we're going to change the ID for this label. Right now it simply reads label 1. Okay, We want to assign an ID to this label that is a little more descriptive than simply label 1. So we're going to give it an ID that reads LBL for label 
and then contact reason. Typed just as you see it right now. Okay, LBL contact reason. Okay, that's going to be the ID of this button. It's important when you're doing website design and you're adding things like labels and text boxes to your user interface that you give them good IDs like we've just done. Okay, and we're going to do this throughout the video. Okay, but there are other things that you can change um, in association with the label too. I'd like to ask you in the properties window to scroll up a little bit and you should see a row that's labeled font. Okay, you can open that row up and close it. Okay, you can change certain properties of the font for this label, one of which is whether it's bold or not. Right now it's not bold. You can see right beside the word bold it says false. Well, let's change that to true. And now you can see the label is bold. Okay. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to add five or so more labels to our page. I'm not going to talk while I'm doing it because we're going to go through the same series of steps that we just went through, but I'll go through them slowly and what we're going to do is we're going to add five more labels. I guess I should mention again one more time. I know I said I wasn't going to do a lot of talking, but I did want to walk through the process of dragging things like labels and text boxes over into your page. What you do is you left click okay, the item that you want to add. You left click and you hold the left button down and then you drag over into your web page, into the specific location where you want in this case the label to be added and then you release the left mouse button. Okay, so make sure you save your changes. Okay, we've just added five more labels to this particular page. Okay, so what I'd like to ask you to do now is run your website again. Check out the changes that you've made. See how they look actually in the browser. 
Okay, so there are our labels. Nice and neat, lined up in bold. Okay. So let's continue on with this page because we're going to make more changes. What we're going to do now, beside the labels, is we're going to add things like drop down lists, okay, and text boxes and buttons. Okay, but before we do that, what I'd like to ask you to do is notice how the table, the size of the column, sort of changed as we were adding those labels. Okay, well, that's okay. We can change it back. If you place your cursor in between the two columns, like I've done, and then do a left click, you can resize those column widths, okay, so that the first column is smaller and so that the second column is wider, larger, like you see. Okay? Now the first field, I'll call it, that we're going to add into our web page, right beside the contact reason, okay, is a drop down list. Okay, you can see that in the standard toolbox, sort of towards the top. There it is. Drop down list. So drag a drop down list over into your page, right beside the contact reason. Okay. And then what we're going to do is we're going to add items okay, to the drop down list. Right now it doesn't contain any items, okay, but we're going to add items to it. You should see a pop up beside the drop down list. Okay. And in that pop up it should say choose data source and edit items. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to push the edit items hyperlink, but if you don't see that um, little pop-up beside the drop-down list. That's okay if you don't see it if it looks something like that. You can bring it back up. If you place your cursor over the drop-down list, a little button should appear that has a, what is that, a uh, greater than symbol. Push it. And that brings the pop-up up again. And then you can push edit items. What we're going to do is we're going to add three items to our drop-down list. So push the Add button and then underneath of List Item Properties beside Text type in the word Praise. Oops, Praise. And then hit Enter. Then push the Add button again and beside Text type in the word Complaint and hit enter. Push the add button again and beside text type in contact me and hit enter. So now we've added three items to our drop down list and you can push on OK. Okay. Now with the drop down list selected, okay, I'd like to ask you to go into the properties window, scroll down to the very bottom where it says ID, okay, and we're going to give our drop down list a good name. It's going to be LST contact reason. LST contact reason. Probably noticing how each of these fields the ID at least for each of these fields when we name it is prefixed with three characters. The labels were prefixed with LBL. Well that's because all labels should be prefixed with an LBL and then a name that describes the label. Well with a drop down list its ID, its name should start with an LST and then a specific name that describes the drop-down list. Okay. So there's our contact reason drop-down list. Now what we're going to do for the first name, for the last name, oh, and I just noticed I have an error there, don't I? The first name. Uh, well, actually, that's the last name field. It's labeled incorrectly. Its text is incorrect. It shouldn't say first name. It should say last name. Okay, But what we're going to do for the first name, for the last name, email address, phone number, and message is we're going to drag over text boxes. 
Okay, so in the toolbox, underneath the standard, towards the bottom, you should see an item for toolbox. Okay, so do a left click, select it, and then drag over, okay, to where my cursor is flashing right now, and drop the text box right beside first name. Okay, and uh, let's go over into the properties uh, window. We're going to make a few changes to the properties of this text box. First of all, we're going to give it a good name. Instead of text box 1, we're going to name it TXT, first name. And then, we're going to change its width. You see, two of the properties of a text box are its width and its height. Okay. Right now, it's just defaulting to a specific value. I'm not sure what the exact value is, but I'd like to make that text box a little bit wider, a little bit longer. So I'm going to change its width to 200 pixels. And you can see it got wider. Okay, you can see it got wider. Okay, so make sure you're saving as you go. We're going to make uh, the, do the same thing for the first name, or the last name, excuse me, the email address, and the phone number. Okay, we're going to drag over text boxes we're going to give them good names, and then we are going to change their width so that they're all 200 pixels. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, now for the phone number, in addition to changing its width and giving it an ID, we're also going to change its text property. Okay, so scroll up in the property properties window to where you see text. Right now there is no text in the text box, but we could place text there if we want to. Okay, we could type in something like this. and you can see that text appears in the text box. Okay. It can be changed by the user when the website is running, but that will be the default text displays in the text box when the web page first loads in the browser. And you could have done that very same thing with the first name and the last name fields. For example, if I select the first name text box, I can go to its text property in the properties window and I could say enter first name. Okay, and there you see it. Okay, now in the uh, messages, uh, excuse me, beside a message, we're going to add another text box, but we're going to do something slightly different to it. Instead of just changing its width and giving it an ID, okay, we're going to change its text mode. So over in the properties window, scroll down a little bit to where you see text mode. You can see right now the default is that it's single line, which means that the user would be able to type in a single line of text. But what you can do is you can change that. You could change it to password. You could change it to multi-line. We're going to change it to multi-line. And what that means is that the user will have the ability to enter more than just a single line of text into this text box. And you can see, right, that the text box changed. It, it's now got scroll bars on the right side. Okay. Well, we can further change this text box. We can make it bigger. We can change its width, and furthermore, we can change its height if we want to. I don't know what the default height is right now, but I'm going to change it. Okay, 
so that it's higher. And I'm going to change its width so that it's wider. Okay? And the user will be able to input text into that entire area. And it is scrollable, so they could even input more text than that if they want to. Okay? Okay, so we're almost done. The last thing we're going to do is we're going to add a button. Okay? Because after the user selects information and inputs information into this window, they need to be able to send it off somewhere, right? So we're going to drag over a button okay, into our page. So at the top of the standard toolbox, select button, do a left click, drag it over into the page, and then release the button. Okay, And there you can see right now, though, its label simply reads button. We want to change that to something that makes more sense, like submit. And we also want to give the button a good name. So let's call it BTN Submit. Okay. And now I'm thinking I might not have given yet. Looks like I didn't give the message text box a good name. So I'm going to go back, select the message text box, go back and change it. Okay, so that it says TXT message. Okay. I guess I'm just going to make sure that I identified all of the other text boxes appropriately too. Okay, everything looks good. And this is really important, okay, that you do this, okay, that you label, you give good IDs to all of the, the fields in your page. Okay, so make sure you have everything saved and let's run the web application again. Okay, so now you can see our page. You can input information. Okay, we can kind of get an overall feel for how the web, or excuse me, how the page is going to behave. When we click on submit, nothing is going to happen. Okay, because there is no code behind this page, but it is an effective user interface design. We're not done yet, though. We're going to make some more changes to this website. Okay, but you can see the process that's involved. Okay, so close the, the browser and let's go back into our website. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to make some changes to the About Us page. Okay, so select the tab at the top of the code editor that says About Us. Okay, so what we're going to do, again, we're going to go into design mode. Right now we're in source mode. We're going to go into design mode. Okay, and we're going to do the very similar thing that we did in the Contact Us page. We're going to place our cursor in this area that says Content Placeholder. Okay, and we're going to insert a table. And this table is going to be relatively small. It's going to consist of one row only and two columns. So one row and two columns. Okay, and what we're going to do uh, in this table is we're going to uh, drag over two panels, one in each cell. And panels, what they're used for is to group related information together. Okay, they're a good way to group related information and to sort of describe, okay, what you're grouping together. Okay, so what I'd like to ask you to do in the standard toolbox again, towards the bottom you should see an item for panel. Okay, I'd like to ask you to select that and drag that over into the first cell of your table. Okay, and um, in the properties window, scroll up a little bit. There's a property for grouping text, and right now that grouping text is empty. 
I'd like to ask you to type in history. And you should see that, okay, in your page. Okay, and you should see a clear delineation for your panel, the things that you want to group together. Okay, now if you want, you can change the uh, properties of the panel, you, like we did with the labels. If we wanted to, we could change them so that they're bold, that it's bold. Okay. Also, what we're going to change down at the bottom is we're going to give this panel a good name, right? Okay, so it's going to be called PNL for panel, and then history. Okay. Okay. Now again, you can see that our table sort of uh, got realigned when we added the panel. The first column now is very wide and the second column is not quite as wide. Well, we can change that again. If you place your cursor in between the two columns, okay, you can do a left click and then drag, okay, so that the two columns are, are roughly of, of equal width. And make sure you're saving as you go. And now what we're going to do is we're going to add a, a second panel into the second cell of our table. So let's do that. Let's drag over a second panel. And in the properties window, um, well, let's not start with the ID. Uh, let's scroll up a little bit to where it says grouping text. And what we're going to type in is current news current news and let's make the font in that bold and then let's scroll down to the ID and change it from panel 1 to PNL for panel and then current news okay and then save that Okay, now in each of the panels, what we can do is we can begin dragging over things like buttons or calendars or check boxes or list boxes. Okay, what I'm actually going to drag over uh, right now is a bulleted list. I'm going to drag a bulleted list over into the history section. Okay. And just like we saw with the list box, with the bulleted list, you should have this little pop-up that you see. It says choose data source and then edit items. Okay. In that pop-up, select edit items. Okay. And here, what we can do is we can add items to our list. Okay. So let's do that. Let's add three items for old history. Not so old history. almost current history and I know that sounds silly but I'm just trying to illustrate how you would add items to a bulleted list okay and then you can push on okay and there you can see the the bulleted list okay old history not so old history and almost current history okay so all of uh, that list box and all of its items okay are grouped in the history panel and if you wanted to you could add more things into this panel okay you could if you wanted to add a text box you could add if you wanted to a list box you could add a label okay you could add an image if you wanted to okay so you could continue to add things into this panel and they would all be grouped okay grouped together Okay, so um, let's go over into the other panel, okay, for current news, we're here into current news. What we're going to do um, in this panel is we're going to add an image, okay, but before we do that, 
before we add uh, the image into the panel, we actually have to add it to our website. Okay, we have to add it to our website. So um, it's relatively easy to do that. Okay, what I'd like to ask you to do um, is find an image. It doesn't matter if it's a GIF or a JPEG or a PNG file. It doesn't matter. Find an image that you like. Save it somewhere onto your computer. Okay, and then go out to that location where it's saved. Okay, so here I have a JPEG. It's named Tor.jpg. I'm going to double click on it. You can see it's a picture of Chestnut Hill College. Okay, just a plain old JPEG. And, and this would work for a GIF or for a PNG file to any image type. But what I'd like you to do is select it and copy it. Do a copy. Then uh, go back into Visual Web Developer in the Solution Explorer. Make sure your website is selected like you see right now. Then do a right click and do paste. And now you can see that that JPEG okay, is in my website. It's a file in my website. Okay? And I can now reference that file in a page. And that's what I'm going to do. Underneath of Current News, in that panel, Okay. I'm going to drag over an image. In the standard toolbox, there is an item for image. Okay. So I'm going to drag that over into the current news panel. doesn't look like much of anything right now. Okay. But what we're going to do in the properties window, if you scroll down, we're going to go to where it says image URL. Image URL. And if you place your cursor beside where it says image URL, again, you should see a button that has three dots. Push on that. It's going to bring up the Select Image window. And make sure your, your JPEG is selected. Push on OK. And you should be able to see it okay, in your page. Okay, You should be able to see it in your page. Now, let's give it a good name. Going to name it IMG Chestnut Hill. Okay. And if you want to, you could change the width or the height. Be careful, though, there if you're changing the size of an image. Okay. Because you could um, make changes to it so that the image is no longer clear, so that its um, scale might look disproportionate. Okay, so be careful. There might be times where you have to change the size of an image, um, and and if you do have to do that, then you should. Um, but be careful with that. What I would recommend, actually, if you have to change the size of an image, only change its height or its width. And what will happen if you do that is the browser will change the other dimension appropriately. Okay, so either change the width or the height, but not both. Okay. But we've added an image. We've given it a good name. Let's uh, save again the changes that we've made to our site and let's test it out. Let's run it. Okay. So now if we go into the about page, we should see our panels. And we should also see our image. We should also see the image. And then we can go back into the Contact Us page. And there we can see our form. And what we're going to do, the last thing that we're going to do, we're actually going to go into the uh, Contact Us page. And we're going to include some data validation rules in this page for required fields and for fields that need to be validated for their data type. Okay? So let's close uh, IE and let's go back into Microsoft Visual Web Developer and we're going to go into the Contact Us page. And what we're going to do is we are underneath of the toolbox, we are going to scroll down to where it says Validation. 
and this is pretty cool. There are different validators that we can add into this page. Okay, we're going to add uh, three validators. Um, a required field validator that's used to validate a field that requires data be input into it. Then there's refer there's a regular expression validator. And what the regular expression validator does is it validates the data type of a field. So for example, the phone number. We're going to validate the data type of that field so that only US telephone numbers may be input. Same thing with the email address field. We're going to put a regular expression validator on this field that ensures that only valid email addresses are input into it. And then what we're going to do is we're going to include a validation summary validator at the very bottom okay, of the window. Okay, and what that validation summary validator is going to do is it's going to summarize all of the validation errors that have occurred in a window. Okay, so uh, let's start this process off. The first name field. Okay, we're going to add a required field validator to it. So in your toolbox underneath the validation, select required field validator and drag it over into your page. And right now it reads required field validator. Okay, we don't want it to read that. What we want it to read is an asterisk. Okay, and the actual message of, and you can see when I changed that error message to an asterisk, you could see the asterisk displayed there now on the page. But the actual text message that we want to have displayed and this text message is going to get displayed in another location on the page. What we want it to read is first name is required. Okay. Now, with these validators, we can change their properties. Okay. Uh, we could change the font if we wanted to. We could make it bold if we wanted to. Okay. We can also um, change the for color. That means the color of the font. We could change it to red if we want to. Okay, and it will appear in red. Okay, and uh, let's test that out. Let's see what happens. Let's save this. And let's run our website. Let's go into the Contact Us page. Oops, I made one mistake. I'm glad that happened. Let's close IE. There's one thing I failed to add for this validator, and it's a critical part, a very, very critical part. If you select the validator, go over into the Properties window, and scroll down a bit. Underneath of Behavior, there's a property called Control to Validate. You have to specify which field, which control this validator is going to validate. Okay, So beside control to validate, you should see a little arrow for a drop down. You have to select the field. And the field that we want this validator to validate is the text first name field. Okay, text first name. So I'm glad that error happened. Okay, Very important for these validators you must specify the control to validate. Okay, so let's run the web application again and hopefully this time it behaves for us. I think it will. Let's go into the contact us page and it did. It behaved that time. And what we're going to do is we're going to remove that text that said enter first name. We're not going to put anything in the text field. Okay, and you could see as I tabbed out we got the error message first name is required. Okay, first name is required. Okay, now if I click on submit, I can still see that message. Okay, first name is required. Okay, I think actually what I'm going to do, we're going to close IE. Okay, we're going to close IE. We're going to go back into Visual uh, Web Developer. 
Okay, and I think I may have reversed um, the information that I have in the error message and the information that I have in the actual text field. What I'm going to like to ask you to do is flip-flop that information. Right now, beside text, it says first name is required. I'd like you to remove that from there and place that up in the error message. And then down below where it says text, I'd like you to put the asterisk. Yes, and then hit enter. And that's the way that we want it to be. Okay, at least that's the way I'd like you to set it up for now for testing purposes. So flip-flop the way that I had originally told you to input the text and the error message so that it looks like that. So beside text we have asterisk and beside error message we have first name is required. Okay, so let's run that and see how that change is going to manifest itself in the page. I go into the contact us page and I remove enter first name and I tab out we can now see an asterisk okay and it should stay there if I click on submit okay and that may not make sense for now but trust me it will as we continue on with this so hang in there with me okay so let's close IE and what we're going to do is we're going to add required field validators to the last name, to the email address, and to the phone number. The same exact fashion. Okay, so let's do that. Don't forget to specify a control to validate. In this case, it's going to be the text last name control. Okay, there's the last name. Let's do the email address. Okay, so now we have one, two, three, four required field validators that we've added. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add two regular expression validators, one for the email address and one for the phone number because we want to make sure that only valid email addresses are input into the email address text box and we want to make sure that only valid US phone numbers are input into the phone number text box. So let's start off by adding a regular expression validator for the email address. So select regular expression validator and drag it over beside the required field validator that we previously added for the email address. Okay. We're going to change its error message. OK. 
okay so that it reads only valid email addresses may be entered its text is going to be an asterisk we'll change its for color to red and we'll change its font to bold we'll make sure that we specify a control to validate it's going to be the text email address control and for these regular expression validators there's one more thing you have to specify one more property if you scroll down a little bit more you should see a property for validation expression place your cursor in the text field beside that and you should see a button with three dots push that button and then you should see a window called the regular expression editor that has a listing of different regular expressions that you would like to apply to the text field At the top you should see French phone number French postal code there's one internet email address okay select it and then down below in this validation expression you should see a bunch of stuff that makes absolutely no sense to anybody um, and that's okay but you want to make sure that internet email address is selected underneath of standard expressions and what that's going to do is it's going to make sure that a valid email address is input into the field then you can push on OK okay and then beside the phone number we're going to do a very similar thing. We're going to drag over a regular expression validator and place it right beside the required field validator that we previously added. Okay, we're going to change its error message so that it reads um, valid telephone number must be entered. Okay, we're going to change the font again to bold keep things consistent change the color of the message to red change the text to an asterisk scroll down in the properties window a little bit and select the control to validate it's going to be the txt phone number control and then down below where it says validation expression place your cursor beside it push the button with the three dots and in the regular expression editor window scroll down to where you see US phone number and push on OK and then make sure you're saving as you go okay now um, I told you before the fact that our the text of our messages right now is simply an asterisk it doesn't really make sense here's the part where I'm going to explain why it does make sense at the bottom of this window what we're going to do is we're going to add a validation summary validator and what it's going to do this validation summary validator is it's going to pull all of the specific error messages for each one of these first name is required last name is required etc. It's going to pull all of those specific error messages and it's going to summarize them at the bottom of the window. Okay, so let's drag over a validation summary validator. Into uh, the window. And I believe that's all that we have to do for this particular validator but we'll find out in just a minute when we test it okay so let's run our website let's go into the contact us page and let's remove that first name let's remove the phone number and let's push on submit 
is, and you can see the error messages are now displayed at the bottom of the window. First name is required, last name is required, email address is required, phone number is required. You can still see the asterisks there, okay, beside the individual fields that are in error. Okay, but let's test the, the validators out a little bit to make sure that they're working. If I input a first name and a last name, these error messages better go away. And they did. Okay, if I input an invalid email address and an invalid phone number, I have my regular expression validators that are kicking in. I can see the asterisks up here and I can see the messages that I want to see. But if I correct the format of the email address and the phone number so that they're now valid, I click on submit and the validators go away. Now one other thing I could have done with this validation summary at the bottom, I too could have changed um, its font so that it would be bold and I could also change its color so that it's red. Okay, And that would make the page, to me at least, behave a little more consistently. So let's test that out just for completeness. Yes, to me that looks a little bit better, a little bit cleaner. Okay, um, but this concludes uh, the video. Uh, we've done a fair amount uh, in just a short period of time. Okay, we, we've designed a nice uh, website. It's certainly not complete, but it does contain um, a decent amount of contact. There is certainly more that you can do and, and more that you will do when you're designing your user interfaces. Um, I encourage you to test things out to try them and see how they work um, and obviously if you have any questions as you're testing and as you're designing your user interfaces um, you can contact me but I hope you found this uh, video uh, helpful and good luck with your user interface design